Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Jessica Callahan, and I am the chair of TCP's Direction Committee. It is my pleasure to introduce you to tonight's speaker, artist and activist Jackie Summel. For the last 12 years, Jackie has dedicated her life to ending the use of solitary confinement in prisons. After attending a lecture given by Robert King, a man who had spent 29 years in solitary confinement at Angola Prison, Jackie felt she had to take action. She began to write. She wrote letters to several of King's comrades, including Herman Wallace and Albert Woodfox, who had founded the first prison chapter of the Black Panther Party, and together with King became known as the Angola Three. Knowing that Herman was being held in solitary confinement all day every day, Jackie asked him a simple question. What kind of house does a man who has lived in a six foot by nine foot box for over 30 years dream of? This question sparked an art project that is bigger than Jackie and bigger than Herman. Together, Jackie and Herman have created a movement entitled Herman's House that calls for dreaming. It calls for the end of solitary confinement and it calls for critical attention to the influence of racism and the prison industrial complex in the United States today. Just a few weeks ago, on Tuesday, October 1st, we were all surprised to learn that the state of Louisiana had overturned Herman's conviction and called for his immediate release from prison. At this point, Herman had spent over 41 years in solitary confinement for a crime he did not commit. Herman was released and immediately taken to the hospital to be treated for late-stage liver cancer, and he died a free man just three days later on Friday, October 4th. His comrade, Albert Woodfox, has had had his conviction overturned three separate times, and yet he remains in solitary confinement today because the state of Louisiana continues to appeal the decision. Albert is just one of 80,000 people who are being held in solitary confinement in the U.S. on any given day. Amnesty International and numerous other human rights organizations condemn this practice as cruel and unusual punishment and as torture. To get a better idea of what this experience is like, I invite you all to stop by the art installation downstairs after the lecture. Jackie's work serves to share the story of one person's experience with incarceration as a means to illuminate the problematic nature of the prison system nationwide. She has received the Soros Justice Fellowship for her artwork and has completed several residencies both abroad and in the U.S. Now please join me in welcoming Jackie Summel. expecting uh, the audience to be like Red Stevie and then Emily would show up 20 minutes late. So this is awesome. Uh, let's see if I can switch. So thank you so much. This is really lovely. It's really nice to be back at Tulane. Um, I genuinely want to thank TUCP uh, Direction and Jessica Hall Callahan in particular for having me here. I see you have fans too, it's awesome. Um, so I'm gonna be lecturing tonight <clears throat> about the tendency, the habit, the sort of moments in our life when we tend to simplify and reduce ourselves into binaries. Is this echoing really loud? I feel like, yeah, it is. Is that any better? Worse? But I feel like this is more of a discussion than it is a lecture, you know? So I'd love a little bit of back and forth, or sometimes you'll see me struggle for a word, and I'll say, um, 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 and if you know the word, you can yell it out. It's totally fine, right? This is the egoless sort of experience. Uh, I also want to thank Jess and Wende for taping out the cells in the hallway downstairs. It's really awesome. Uh, they taped out two solitary cells downstairs, and it's something that I invite you all to sort of experience, check in, just uh, stand inside a six foot by nine foot space where at any given moment, 80,000 Americans are forced to exist. So those are downstairs in the hallway. Um, I want to start off with the initial poster that was put out. I brought this poster in, or I uh, brought a version of this poster in to Herman, and he was so proud. He was like really excited, and he was like, whoa, 
You're flanked by Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis. You're really doing the work. I'm so proud of you, baby. And I was like, I know, I'm so excited. It's totally amazing. It's great. And there's a lot of crossover in the work that we do, right? A lot of crossover in the work that Michelle, myself, and Angela do. We have really different ways of presenting it to the world, right? I have the distinction of being the only artist on the poster. And actually, the first visual artist to get a Soros Justice Fellowship, which is also kind of amazing. Yeah, shifts, right? Slight shifts. So when I saw this poster, the first thing I, I did was like imagine that uh, Michelle Alexander and Angela Davis were like my hype girls. <laughs> Look how jacked Michelle Alexander is. He's so awesome. And then I started just like letting my imagination run away and I tried to imagine if we were like a girl band. <laughs> what we would look like. And then I thought we, we could be called Cruel and Unusual Punishment. And our first album would be The Eighth Amendment. Isn't that exciting? So um, I know a lot of the students have been like sharpening their academic knives. Um, just because the title is so loaded, I wish the Indians won. So I just want to start there. Right? One of the things that you experience as an artist uh, is the reality. It's reinforced again and again. I'm kind of standing in this awkward position that you have no control on how people read your work. Can you still hear me? It's really hard to tell. Okay, it's better. You have absolutely no control on how people read your work. Right? So they say the viewer finishes the piece. We take our own experiences, our own lives, and we apply it to whatever we see. Right? But I understand that there's this, um, it's bold, right? It's bold to use the word Indian in, a, in an academic setting or in any setting where people are have this license or they're trained to sort of deconstruct, right? The sort of daggers. I went to Stanford and there was this, um, for graduate school, and there was this great sense of like always outdoing, always deconstructing someone else's thoughts, right? And always making it relative to a different philosopher. So I remember just like one day being in class and someone was like Derrida and another person was like Benjamin and then it was like Foucault, 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 Foucault. And I was just like, Bon Jovi, like I just like, didn't have much else than that, you know, as a means to interrupt. Um, so this title, I chose it pretty specifically. I wish the Indians won to sort of challenge yourself in your own thoughts and your own sort of positioning in the world and maybe suggest that there might be other moments or other ways to read this, right? There's other kinds of Indians. And if other kinds of Indians won, what would the potential be for the world? Like if we're looking at <clears throat> the sort of British Raj, and if in this case the Indians won, what kind of power structures would there be in the world? What kind of relationship to Western power in the British Empire? How would things change if things were different in 1867, for instance, if the Indians won? It's one way to sort of read the title. And when I was um, looking at this map of the British Empire, I sort of remembered my eighth grade social studies teacher berating this, like the British were some kind of like colonial, like greedy mongers and like uh, just empire villains, right? And they were like the worst of the worst in history, those British, you know? And then I found this map, which I think is incredible because it's almost identical, except we have more land, right? So I think that's... Uh, Something that I've discovered in the process of discovering, in the process of preparing for this lecture. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that I'm talking about cowboys and Indians and this idea of binaries, right? And I wish the Indians one was a reference to that relationship and the simplicity of that relationship or the desire or habit that we have in Western society to determine our identity based on binaries, right? Based on I am this and you are that, right? I am right, you are wrong. I am good, you are bad. Whatever it might be, right? So if we're looking at cowboys and idiots, oops. <laughs> I, uh, I actually wanted to include this because I know Halloween is coming up and I wanted to encourage Tulane students not to do this. 
Um, there's sort of this, <laughs> yeah. There's this ongoing, it's a heated topic about cultural appropriation that's around New Orleans right now. It's a really important discussion, and I hope that in the process of determining that life is not just binaries, we can sort of look for the richness and the vastness and the complexities of these relationships, right? This is what I hope the outcome of this lecture encourages us to do. Um, and if you don't listen, queer spiracy is going to raise all hell with you, so it's just, it's just a big heads up. Um, so if it is, cowboys and Indians are cowboys and Kevin Costner. I met him. He's actually quite giant. And we start to look at the use of the binary structure, right, as it applies to the stigma, uh, stigma of self, right, of self-identity in opposition to another. I am this, you are that, right? I think what we have is a gross simplification of any given moment, right, of any given experience. And I think what happens when we reduce ourselves to these binaries, which I'd like to get into a little bit more, we hopelessly undervalue our experience. We hopelessly undervalue the vastness of any moment. And I think the saddest thing is that it reduces the potential of, of the miracle. Right? Sort of like, ooh, self-identify in these binaries. So I use my hands a lot. Right? And so I started to wonder, like, where did this idea of binaries come from? And it came from this guy. Gottfried Will, Willem von Leibniz. Um, that was a hard one. And I'd like to read to you his theory on binary opposition, because um, it'll sound much smarter than, it, than if I paraphrase. So a binary system is a pair of related terms or concepts that are opposite in meaning. Binary opposition is the system by which, in language and thought, two theoretical opposites are strictly defined and set off against one another. Binary opposition is an important concept of structuralism, which sees such distinctions as fundamental to all language and thought. A binary opposition is seen as a fundamental organizer of human philosophy, culture, and language. And this is where I think it gets really dangerous, right? This idea that we've become simplistically comfortable and habitualized in the process of identifying with the binary structure of life or of our own personal narratives. Um, I want to talk more about this as we go through the lecture and sort of analyze it. As I said, I want this to be a comprehensive discussion around the habit or the use of uh, the reduction of thoughts and identity into binaries. But when I was doing this research, I found out that good old Gottfried had his own sort of binary, his own nemesis, which was this guy. Does anyone know who that is? Sir Isaac Newton. And they were in this like ancient battle, calculus battle, and um, that they were like defending to the end. And in about 1667, there was a battle over who actually invented a particular differential in calculus called the fluxion. Isn't that an amazing battle? So I imagine, <laughs> I imagine that, this is so goofy, but I imagine that Sir Isaac Newton was like, flux you. <laughs> God, he was like, flux you. Um, thanks. I actually, I actually was imagining this happening. But when I saw this picture, I was like really sort of intrigued and inspired by it. And I was like, wow, who does, who does Sir Isaac Newton look like? Michael Bolton. No kidding. Kind of this amazing moment where it's like you sort of let your imagination go, right? This is what you do. This is like the power of, of being alive and not simplifying your life because you can sort of run with your imagination. And then I was like trying to imagine Michael Bolton singing the three laws of thermodynamics, like matter can neither be created or destroy. Do you want me to sing it? Yeah. No, I'm not going to do that. Um, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Don't you think that would be a good song? Or maybe just inertia. But when I, um, 
was looking at this in Google image search, which is like amazing, like I'm totally in love with it. So I stuck this picture in and then this picture came out. <laughs> So awesome. And then I imagined that this dog was getting all the Grammys that Michael Bolton was getting. And he was like, thank you, thank you. These are for all my, all my bros on the puppy mill. <laughs> Let me have my moment. So Michael Bolton. Does anyone know what the coolest thing about Michael Bolton is? Everything. Everything? The coolest thing. It's not on a spectrum of binaries or polarized opposites. He opened for this guy in 1975. Oh, was uh, Ozzy Osbourne. Yep, Michael Bolton's band Blackjack opened for Ozzy Osbourne in 1975, which I hope brings us back to this discussion of binaries. <laughs> right, I'm positioning this lecture on the oversimplification of binaries as a system of identity that we, particularly in the West, have a tendency to reduce any given moment, any given thought, any given identity to a side, right? In relation to another or in opposition to another. And where I think it becomes particularly dangerous is when we defend ourselves as being right in the face of being wrong, right? It becomes a habit to reduce or limit our outcomes or the potential of personal growth Right? or to reduce the moment of magic to being right in the opposition of being wrong. <clears throat> and then I want to sort of look at some more of these binaries and hopefully lead you through a bigger discussion. Right? So there's good or bad, like or dislike. Right? And then I had sort of questions like, is there ever really anything that is just good or anything that is just bad? It was a very philosophical question. Predator and prey? Hero and villain? Okay. This narrative makes up so much of our own personal and cultural history, this sort of distinction. Male and female? Good and evil. <laughs> Progressive and conservative? Democrat, Republican? Not really. Cowboys and Indians? <laughs> that took you a minute. And then I think we have the big one, right? There's two really big ones. But the system of binaries that defines our so-called judicial system. Guilty or innocent. With very little space in the spectrum in between. Um, I also Google image search guilty or innocent. I just wanted to share that this was one of the first ones that came up. <laughs> guilty or innocent. <laughs> and the one I identify uh, much more with is this one. <laughs> Whew. I love him or her. Did anyone ever see that YouTube viral of the panda sneezing? It's so great. Like, we live at such an amazing time, right? Where you could just sort of like watch a panda sneeze. Like, I'm feeling really bad. I'm just going to watch a panda sneeze. It's awesome. It's like really incredible. Um, so, this is where the discussion becomes a little more loaded. I'll just warn you. Um, again, this is more of a discussion. There'll be time for a Q&A after. But I want to talk about this um, question whether or not our system has the capacity for actual justice when we are forced to rely on a system of binaries. Right? Do we actually limit the potential for our understanding of justice? If we presuppose and agree that binaries are a reduction of possibilities, then a judicial system that does not allow uh, for the space of anything else but guilty or innocent then reduces ourselves to a space where there is no accountability. Right? There is no space for personal growth, forward progress. There is no space for comprehensive justice, or my understanding of comprehensive justice. And I believe we see this, or we saw this, 
very loudly in the George Zimmerman verdict, right? Let me position myself here. I believe George Zimmerman murdered a child. I have absolutely, I am not questioning that at all. I believe he murdered a 17-year-old boy that he presumed to be a predator, right? Because of his own system of binaries and his own personal narrative. I'm not questioning that. But what I'm wondering, and what the question I would like to position is whether or not George Zimmerman had any other choice but to plead not guilty, right? Whether or not this system allows the space to make, A, the most horrible mistake of your life, or whether it allows the space to actually have justice, right? To have discussions around so-called racial progress, to have healing discussions where there's the opportunity for there to be uh, closure, right? to have understanding on both sides. This is the, one of the loudest illustrations of it, right? This, uh, excuse me, this, the verdict for this case. But we see it every single day in the courts, right? This idea where the consequences are so high, right? They're so harsh. In, in many cases, it's mandatory minimum sentencing if you are guilty, that you will do anything and everything to prove that you're not guilty, to prove that you are innocent even if you're not, right? And when you're forced into this spectrum where, oh, hi, Josh. This is one of my kids. Um, where the consequences are so harsh, right, that you just cannot be guilty or else that's the end of your life, you are become property of the state for life, even, it, even if it's not a murder case, right? That's how we end up in a system where 90% of all of our cases are decided by plea bargains. It's not worth the risk. Right? And it's all systems go, no holds barred. Zimmerman spent $1.2 million on his defense. Did you guys know that? It's insane, right? Because the consequences of admitting guilt were too harsh. And I don't think that that leaves the space for actual justice. I don't think there was the space for him to say, look, I did something really, really horrible. I'm ashamed of it. I'm embarrassed of it. I want to grow from it. I want to learn from it. I want the whole country to learn from it, right? He had to say, I am not guilty. I am innocent, and I'm going to raise $102 million from the Tea Party to prove it, right? And I think that's another major tragedy of justice, and one I would like to talk more about. But first, we'll go back to these binaries, and I'll start to discuss another one that I think is really dangerous, um, which is us versus them. Right? And we see this play out in so many cultural narratives. We see it play out in the sort of rhetoric around wars of foreign aggression. We see it play out in these religious wars. And I think most often we see it play out when we can't see the them. Right? That's when the language of vitriol is able to sort of infuse into your thoughts, when it becomes more us versus them, because you don't have the opportunity to explore sameness. Right? We see that uh, in the prison system. Right? It's them. It's those who have been convicted and or pled to a crime that they may or may not have done who are them. And it creates this delta uh, that reduces humanness, right? reduces the ability to want to change the system, to want to dismantle a system of mass incarceration, wrongful convictions, and a plethora of cruel and unusual punishments. Right? So these are just some images where you see that us versus them, the sort of hate vocabulary um, that plays out in a lot of Western power structures, right? A lot of Western narratives. The infinite religious wars, this idea of terrorism, the other, the invisible, the foreign. <clears throat> And that leads us, as I said, to this system of mass incarceration, wrongful conviction, cruel and unusual punishment, because it's not us. Generally, it's not us in this room. Um, I'm pretty sure that my hype girls are going to do a really great job analyzing the, a comprehensive academic analysis of this historical uh, transcendence from slavery into the convict leasing system, into the prison industrial complex. So I don't feel like I need to go too deep into it. 
But for those of you who are unsure um, about this, Louisiana, the state where most of us pay taxes, is the greatest incarcerator per capita in the world. Okay? Are we all on the same page about that? Yeah. I just read a stat that said about one out of 45 Louisianans are incarcerated. One out of every 45. One out of every four black men between the ages of 18 and 32 are under some kind of correctional control in the state of Louisiana. Probation, parole, or incarcerated. These are astounding facts. I'm debating which direction to go. I feel like this conversation of neo-slavery is something that is now becoming more and more part of the mainstream in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago. And it's not that I feel like I need to let it go or that it's not an important conversation, but I want to contextualize it in the conversation around creating these binaries, the right and wrong, the us and them, the good and bad, right? <clears throat> this is uh, a Banksy mural, what do you call it a mural? Banksy graffiti, that I think kind of summarizes everything. For those of you who don't know, uh, the 13th Amendment, with which allegedly eradicated slavery, actually ratified it. So it said that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for a crime, whereof the party shall be duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any of its subjects in jurisdiction. So the 13th Amendment actually legalized slavery for those duly convicted of a crime, right? justly convicted of a crime. And the question is whether or not that just, that justice actually exists in a simplified system. In Louisiana, we have this crazy prison called Angola. It's the largest prison in America. Not in terms of population, but in terms of, in terms of size. Right, 18,000 acre former slave plantation named for the place in Africa where the initial slave owners felt the most profitable, the most lucrative slaves came from. Excuse me. Every able-bodied prisoner in Angola prison is forced, for two to, forced to work for two to 20 cents an hour, a minimum of 40 hours a week. Right, this is a for-profit system, which I think there's no question that this is this is a continuation of slavery. It's the same economic paradigms of slavery. Right? Another thing that I think is a really important uh, fact is that Louisiana has the inc highest incarceration rate in the world. And we also have the most exonerees, which is some crazy math in between. Right? There's something that is not just, that is not working within our system, that incarcerates more people than any place in the world and exonerates more people based on factual innocence than any place in the world, right? So then let's enter Angola prison, the Angola three. Yeah, you can raise your fist, you can clap. Yeah. So in the 1970s, Angola prison was the bloodiest prison in America. They say an average of 42 stabbings on any given week, um, yeah. It was uh, segregated. There was a lucrative rape trade that was happening. They had this crazy system of khaki backs where inmates who were serving life sentences without the possibility of parole who showed good behavior in the terms of good and bad for 10 years were able to actually become armed guards. Um, and it, within that system, there was a lot of corruption. Again, the for-profit within and behind the prison walls, within the invisible structures of prison. Um, it, was, it was a time of civil unrest in the United States, the 1970s. You saw a lot of black nationalist groups, in particular the Black Panther Party, rising, right? This sort of up, uprisings and upheavals of normative structures. Things weren't working. People were really aware. The Vietnam War was uh, in the living rooms of most Americans, and people were pretty unhappy. And you have these three men who formed the first chapter of the Black Panther Party inside 
prison walls, right? Inside the walls of Angola prison in 1970. <clears throat> in forming this chapter of the Black Panther Party, they were able to assuage a lot of the race tensions that were happening. They were able to end, put an absolute stop to the prison rape that was happening. They filed writs, they filed legislation. They were able to change the structure of the prison from the inside out. Right? It's an incredible feat that also made them targets to an all-white prison administration. And in 1972, April 17th, uh, a white prison guard named Brent Miller was murdered, stabbed 32 times inside a dorm room. The entire prison went on lockdown. Nobody saw anything happen. 42, later, 42 hours later, 42, wait, 20, 48 hours later, <laughs> Eyewitnesses came forward. Oh, it was Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, and Robert King, the Angola Three. I think I just assumed you guys knew who they were, so I didn't say their names. Herman Wallace, Robert King, and Albert Wood Fox. Um, after Brent Miller was murdered, <clears throat> all three men went into lockdown, solitary confinement. Uh, where they remain for the rest of their sentences in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day for the remainder of their sentences. What is significant about this punishment is that uh, Robert King spent 29 years in solitary confinement, 31 years of a wrongful conviction for a crime he couldn't have possibly committed, right? So King was in Orleans Paris prison at the time that Brent Miller was murdered although he spent 29 years in solitary confinement under the investigation for the murder of Brent Miller. Right? Behind prison walls. This is what's happening. And you can't see it, it's the other. This is what's happening. King's conviction was for the murder of another prisoner. He was not ever convicted for killing Brent Miller, which is how his conviction was able to be overturned on February 7, 2001, and he walked out of Angola prison a free man. Robert King, uh, came to San Francisco where I was in grad school, as you know, um, to talk about the experiences of being in solitary confinement, the experiences of being in Angola prison, the experiences of wrongful conviction, all of these things that I had never really heard about. This is, you know, 12 years ago. Um, in fact, the story goes that I, um, I had a crush on the organizer that was bringing King to this really small space in San Francisco. It's a true story. And um, so I had no idea what I was about to see or what he was about to talk about. I really just cared what my hair looked like, you know, <laughs> which wasn't pretty good. But then um, I was riding my bicycle there, you know, in San Francisco, and I, on Market Street, I got cut off by this big, fancy SUV. And I, like, literally threw my bicycle down and got up, and I was like, you effing gas-guzzling MF, blah, 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 blah. And I was, like, ready to throw down, like, full-on Long Island style, like, snake in my neck, you know, like I was going to do something. And then I went up the stairs, and I, like, fixed my hair, fixed my makeup, and I sat down, and I listened to this man talk about being in a six-foot-by-nine-foot cell for 29 years for a crime he didn't commit with no visible anger, right? with no visible frustration, with the ability to transform all of that into social change. And I was like, shit. <laughs> I have something to learn from this man, right? It was this moment in my life where I was like, fuck, I had no idea any of this existed. And then this man, whose, whose wrongdoings are far worse than being cut off by an SUV, right, can sit here and talk about these things with the vision and the ability to transform them into change, right? into social change. And so I was like, what can I do? I, don't get, I, don't, I, didn't even know, I didn't even know this existed. Like, what can I do in the world? I'm just an artist, you know? And he said, write my comrades. So I started writing Herman Wallace and Albert Wood Fox. Um, I need a sip of tea, excuse me one second. So in this picture you see Herman's Black Panther, Black Market sweatshirt um, that he made himself. He was all these pretty styly, but this sweatshirt in particular got him a year in the dungeon um, because it's not state-issued clothing. It's incredible. It's also considered contraband in Angola. 
um, with the intention that he could incite a riot by wearing a Black Panther handmade sweatshirt. I want to talk a little bit about the idea of solitary confinement because it's consistent in all of their histories. And I think it's, uh, I shouldn't say I think, and it's something that Herman, Robert, and Albert committed themselves to changing. Right? The idea that at any given point in this country, 80,000 or more people are in a six foot by nine foot cell indefinitely. Right? Indefinite sentences where you're given maybe one hour outside of that cell, either in a, a pen outside or running up and down the hall. And one of the one of the ways that makes solitary confinement so hard to fight and so hard to target is that people don't necessarily call it solitary confinement. Right? Those in power, the power structures, have all different names for it, like ADSEG in Angola, it's CCR, the SHU, IMU. Right? There's all these different names, the dungeon, isolation, etc. I think the point or the space that we have to get to collectively and cohesively is that solitary confinement is torture. Right? That is the one word that needs to be associated with solitary confinement. If you're unsure of this, go down to the cells that they taped out and stand inside of it. Right? Try to imagine them encaged by walls and encaged by bars and see if you can imagine spending one day, one year, 40 years in solitary confinement. Uh, this is not Angola, but this is very. This is actually a, a prison in Texas, very similar to the way Angola uh, holds their inmates in solitary. So it's cage, uh, cage next to cage next to cage next to cage, much like the SPCA, right? So one of the arguments that Buddy Caldwell is presenting publicly is that it's not solitary confinement because you can hear each other. Totally absurd. So I asked Robert what I could do, and he said. You could get a new haircut. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I had a mohawk for like two years. <laughs> Such a bad idea. Um, and now it's documented in a film. So, um, yeah, have to get over that. I, um, I asked him what to do, and he said, write my comrades. And so as I said, I began writing both Herman and Albert. And a lot of people ask me, why did you do the house that Herman built? Why not the house that Albert built or that they built, you know? And the answer is simple, because shortly after I began writing Herman and Albert, Herman got thrown into the dungeon for possessing contraband, which at that point in time was some Black Panther leaflets. Um, and I think it might have been another one of those cases with like a needle and thread or something that he wasn't necessarily supposed to have. Um, so he spent... 12, 16 months in the dungeon for that infraction. The dungeon in Angola is actually more punitive than solitary confinement. It's a cell within a cell without any natural light. You have um, your visiting privileges, phone privileges, reading material, all of that stuff is completely reduced. It's basically like you in a cot. Like all of the nightmare stories that you see in the films about what solitary confinement is, is the dungeon. Another incredible... A uh, mechanism of cruel and unusual punishment is that when you're in the dungeon, Camp J in Angola, you're given what's called the loaf, right? Which is the leftovers from the day before that they put together in this big vat and then bake it so it's like a big loaf of bread. And that's your food. That's your meal. That's what you're given. Um, a slice of that every day. Yeah. Cruel and unusual. So I began to write Herman, and I started to notice that through his letters, his ability to focus, that he was suffering a lot more than Albert. Um, he was unable to hold a cohesive thought for very long. He started to like sort of go off on these tangents, and his actual physical handwriting started to shift. And at that time, I was at Stanford University on a full ride with stipend to make art, right? And I was like, what? What world is this, right? <laughs> like, that you have these complete polar opposite situations where there's all of this privilege. You're paying me to make art surrounded by horses that are, like, more expensive than anything I've ever owned, right? And then this man is in a six-foot-by-nine-foot box for 30 years. At that time, it was 30 years, right? So I, um, 
at that point, I just began to ask him to describe his own surroundings. Um, and, and he offered this letter for me, which I think is, or drew this letter for me, is really telling um, and kind of amazing. And then at a certain point, I was given this really indulgent exercise at Stanford University where they said, ask one of your professors what their dream house looks like. And I was like, are you kidding? I can't, I can't do this. I can't indulge anymore. Like, this is disgusting, you know? And so I asked Herman's lawyers if it would be okay to ask him. Would it be okay? Is this me? Is this torture? Like, am I adding to his sense of where he's not by asking, them, asking him this question? Herman was serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole in his 30th year of solitary confinement in Angola. You know, I wasn't sure. I was very new to this experience of writing the incarcerated. And they said, no, go ahead and do it. He, do anything, right? He's suffering. Try something. And so I asked him, what kind of house does a man who's lived in a six foot by nine foot box thir for 30 years dream of? And he wrote back and he was like, I don't dream about a house. I'm a revolutionary. I dream about being on the hills of Mexico, armed, fighting for the rights of indigenous people. And I was like, you're 60. <laughs> House might be a good thing. So he indulged. And this was the first drawing that he sent me. And I was like, wow, that is um, very finished. How'd that happen? And then I could kind of see that the, the lines on the drawing were like so deeply imprinted on the paper. And I was like, you trace this. <laughs> This is not your imagination. Jeez. But, um, but what was so endearing about it is it was the childhood home of one of his long-term, long-time supporters. And so I thought that was such a beautiful gesture in terms of the people that he wanted to represent or that inspired him or that were meaningful to him. So we started here. And while I was at Stanford, you can imagine I had access to like the most amazing libraries ever. And they had this whole library that was like dedicated, not that I used them, those of you who know me. I could barely read. Um, it's true, but I like colors and I have a really like wide spectrum of color variability. Reading is overrated. So, but they had this whole uh, library that was just dedicated to architecture. And so I would like photocopy, like meticulously photocopy all of these ideas for these different houses and whatever and send them into it. It was like a really lovely exchange between Herman and I, which at the time was just between Herman and I. It was just my way of sharing the experience of my imagination with him, right? The experience that helped me survive the moments that I thought were impossible, my own personal mini deaths, right? It was always my imagination that got me out of them. And I was like, Phew. That's all I got. I don't have money. I don't have power in the sense of like power structures. I don't have connections to the rich and famous, but I have my imagination. And let's, let's see where that brings us, Herman. And so he began to dream, right? And he began to modify these houses. Uh, the pictures that I sent him, he didn't like any of them for the record. He's like, what, what kind of houses are people living in? That's crazy town, you know, like tree houses and no windows, <laughs> whatever. I'm doing a re really bad job of impersonating Herman. <laughs> I think it's because I'm nervous. Um, so Herman's drawings became my drawings, and then my drawings sort of became uh, models, which I would send him pictures of, right? And he would modify, and then I would modify. And those models developed into further models. And then we started to realize that <clears throat> the more I talked about Herman's house, the more people listened, right? Because at any given moment in any one of our lives, even if we think it's the greatest moment of our life, there is a whole trajectory of sadness that's happening around us, right? And the things that we focus on in today's media, the things that we're bombarded with are overwhelmingly sad. They're overwhelmingly depressing. They're overwhelmingly structured to make us feel powerless. Right? But then I would talk about Herman Wallace's dream house. People would be like, who? Herman Wallace. You know, he spent 30, 31st year of solitary confinement in Angola prison in Louisiana. What? And he's dreaming about a house. And it was this access point for us to stop seeing the other to see this person who dreams the same, same way that we dream, right? Who just like us lives, breathes, dreams, thinks, and uses his imagination. 
And things started to shift. And then we both realized, oh, this is a great organizing tool. Let's push it. Right? And so I began to really develop the project into an exhibition, um, which, as I said, has a multitude of models. And then this CAD model, which was my first CAD drawing, computer-aided drawing, which developed into more functional CAD drawings. Excuse me, I have a hiccup. This is Herman's pool. <laughs> so awesome. Um, so the first thing that Herman asked for was, was gardens. Um, he asked that his house be surrounded by gardens, that there be a sense of life and rejuvenation at all times. He was very specific about the flowers that he wanted. He was very specific, um, or he honored particular organizers by asking for their favorite flowers or their favorite fruits in the gardens. But then he also wanted to make sure that they were, um, what's the word, Emily? Like perennial, that they, there was always flowers in the garden, which I think is a really beautiful gesture. The second thing he asked for was a large swimming pool with a Black Panther in the center. <laughs> Power. Um, within the context of the exhibition, which is ongoing and still developing, I would recreate Herman's cell Right? based on his drawings and based on our personal conversations. And there was this really beautiful exchange where Herman was leaving his cell to go inside his house, and I was entering his cell through his own words and through his own experiences, and then rebuilding it piece by piece, uh, space by space. And that's overwhelming. And when you're actually inside the cell, you recognize the impossible experience, the impossible destination that Herman Wallace, Albert Wood Fox, and Robert King, and 80,000 Americans at any given moment are forced to endure. It's cruel and unusual. So this exhibition has done really well. I'm very grateful for it. It's traveled around the world. It was here in Prospect One. I think it's been shown in like 18 countries or something like that. And um, there's been a lot of really positive feedback um, that book came out, I, I, I published a book which sold out and I had to republish it, which is really exciting. And then the film, um, there's two websites, interactive website and then uh, my website, hermanshouse.org. Um, but, but what this project ultimately did was push me to the brink of exhaustion <laughs> and push me to the point where I'm now living in New Orleans. I bought a house in New Orleans with the intention of actually building Herman's dream home, right? which is a huge shift from the imagination, from this idea of using it as an organizing tool explicitly as an exhibition or a book or an online space, to actually building Herman Wallace's dream home after he spent 42 years in solitary confinement for a crime he didn't commit. You, you can clap for that too, guys. Yeah, it's really unexpected. And there's an unstoppable momentum behind the project. So even if I was like, I can't do this anymore, I'm completely devastated, I'm just like completely exhausted, behind all of that is hundreds, if not thousands, of folks who are like, this is great. Herman Wallace deserves to be remembered, deserves to be celebrated, and deserves to have his house built. Um, <clears throat> This is part of that momentum. I was hoping Nina would be here and she'd be really excited about that picture. In Germany, Academy of Solitude, they actually have a library named after Herman, um, the Herman Wallace Library. And in it is a collection all, uh, of all of his radical books. And they're holding all of those books until his house gets built. And then they'll send them to New Orleans, which is pretty amazing. I've read none of them. Um, like I said, unstoppable momentum. This is kind of the pinnacle of my career. Does anyone know who that is? Annie Lennox, Annie Lennox with my book. <laughs> Sweet dreams are made of these. <laughs> this is not even a good photo. I just keep using it in all my lectures because it's so exciting. She, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll move on from there. The actual <laughs> pinnacle not only of my career, but of my lifetime, is this moment. Yeah. yeah. 
On October 1, 2013, Herman Wallace's conviction was overturned, and he left the confines of the state of Louisiana Department of Corrections unshackled, unchained, a free man and innocent in the eyes of the law. It's fucking amazing. <laughs> It's a tremendous moment in history that should be celebrated, should be revered, and I liken it to the release of Nelson Mandela or Aung San Suu Kyi, one that we in the city of New Orleans, the highest incarcerator in the world, should continue to celebrate. As many of you know from recent media, <clears throat> after 42 years of solitary confinement, cruel and unusual punishment, and what I call lethal injustice, Herman's life was consumed by liver cancer. He died three days later, surrounded by the people who loved him in a supporter's home here in the city of New Orleans. But he died free. And that is amazing. That is a treasure. Yeah. So that was part of his fight, right? maintaining his innocence for 42 years from a six foot by nine foot box. Um, his fight stretched far beyond his immediate situation. Um, what we see in the immediate future is now that we have this judicial momentum in freeing two out of the three of the Angola three is now Albert's case. So Albert's conviction has been overturned three times. Although he remains in solitary confinement in David Wade Correctional Facility in Homer, Louisiana. It's unbelievable. And so what we're asking people to do is to sign petitions, asking Buddy Caldwell, Attorney General of the State of Louisiana, to stop appealing, right? Two out of the three convictions have been overturned. Wood Fox is in his 42nd year of solitary confinement, give or take a year. And as an innocent man, right? It's, absolute, it's another atrocity of injustice in the state of Louisiana, which is plagued historically by injustice, right? shameful injustice. Um, there's a petition to ask them to stop appealing. Emily Posner, if you would just stand up for a second. Don't be dramatic. So Emily Posner, did you bring the things? So if anybody who's registered to vote in the state of Louisiana could, there's like a little scan thing, you know, for your smartphones, and you can scan and sign another petition asking for the legislature in the state of Louisiana, <coughs> excuse me, to host a hearing on, on the use of solitary confinement, the use of long-term solitary confinement, because we have to stop it. It is cruel and unusual punishment. <coughs> I went a lot faster than uh, I was expecting. And I usually finish my lectures and then open them up for questions with this slide, um, which I think is amazing and celebrates what's necessary in the struggle to dismantle the system of mass incarceration, wrongful conviction, and, and cruel and unusual punishment. Um, but in the wake and the loss of Herman Wallace, um, I've received a lot of really incredible, beautiful letters of, of, what's the word? This is when you guys help me. Like when you, condolence. Yeah, letters of condolence, letters celebrating Herman, right? Letters of recognition of his struggle. Um, and this is my favorite image. Uh, so I would like to end my portion of the lecture here, open it up for questions. Um, is that not the most amazing Black Panther you've ever seen? <laughs> I think it's totally incredible. I want to see more of these all over the city of New Orleans. So before you guys try and applaud or do something that makes me feel more awkward, I want to reinforce the fact that the state of Louisiana incarcerates more people than any place per capita in the world. We also have the most exonerees, right? And much the same, I liken it to the process of making a diamond, right? Like all of the stuff, the decay, the dirt, the bones, the shit, the piss, whatever, is compressed down and down and down and left, right? Isolated, forgotten for years and years. And some of that turns into diamonds, the preciousness of diamonds. Because we are the greatest incarcerator with the greatest number of exonerees, 
we have the most diamonds in our community, and it's incredible. And so if any of this stuff moves you to the point of anger or frustration, I encourage you all to reach out to organizations like Vote, Voice of the Ex-Offender. Yeah, with Norris Henderson. Is Norris or someone from Vote here? Yeah. Yeah, so in the back, they're raising their hands. Um, plug in, you know, this is like, you guys are movers and shakers, most of the youth that are here at Tulane. Use your tools. Right? Use your privilege. Use whatever you can to be able to connect to these folks. John Thompson, Ray, Resurrection After Exoneration. Uh, Walimu Johnson is also an incredible jewel and treasure amongst our community. Sharif Cousin, who's recently exonerated. We also have Calvin Duncan, um, Robert King, who lives in Austin, Texas right now. Malik Rahim and Robert Goodman. So I want to pay homage to all of them. They have become my elders. They have become my guide. They have become my diamonds. Um, and I want to thank you guys for coming tonight. It's really amazing.